Welcome to the Pitching Command Show, brought to you by Command Tracker, the smart target that MLB and D1 teams rely upon to measure and train command. Many throw hard, but few command. Visit commandtracker.com. Hey, joining today's podcast is my friend Burke Badenhop, former MLB pitcher and assistant to the GM for the Diamondbacks. Welcome, Burke. I'm thrilled to have you on the show. Thanks, Wayne. Really appreciate it. Happy to be here. Oh, thanks. Hey, you've had a great career in baseball as a pitcher starting in college with Bowling Green State University. And you were drafted in the 19th round in 2005 by the Tigers. And then you were traded in their package for Miguel Cabrera. Yeah. That's got to be pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, brought me to relevance here as he's finished his career up and everything. But, you know, as he's out the door, made my relevance and stayed in and stuff. But that's uh, that's a bullet point for my career forever. Well, well, you you then spent eight years pitching in the major leagues. Yeah. You know, that's just getting to the major leagues is ma- is big. But to pitch for eight years and you were with the Marlins, the Rays, the Brewers, the Red Sox and the Reds. Uh you're currently in your seventh season with the Diamondbacks and currently a special assistant to the GM, as I said. That's a solid baseball career. Yeah, yeah, I'm I'm really, uh, really blessed to have been able to play, you know, for so long, like you said, uh, pro ball for 12 years, eight in the major leagues, and then to have, um, you know, uh, an organization come kind of find me after I was done playing to, to work for them and to be in our seventh season and um, still in the playoffs, you know, as we talk about this right now and everything. So, yeah, a lot of a uh, lot of things have gone, um, you know, gone right for me. I, I'm glad you said, too, because I think one of the biggest things I always stress about being a good pitcher is uh, character. You know, I think character is very important for a lot of different reasons. And uh, I'm glad you said that. Yeah. Uh, what are you doing with the uh, Diamondbacks nowadays? So when I was original, originally hired seven years ago, like we're just on the kind of the the beginning of a lot of like the data and the stuff. Um, yeah. So when I played for the Red Sox in 14, Mike Hazen and Amiel Sade and, and everybody, they were with the Red Sox as well. Um, and they had known that I had used just some of the basic websites like Brooks Baseball and stuff to look at my data and everything. And so they thought this guy's, you know, knows data. He's pitched for a while, a little bit, you know? And so I um, helped kind of usher in some of our processes and everything. And I basically used some data and biomechanics and stuff to deal with developing our pitchers as well as acquiring pitchers um, a lot through the draft, but then also waivers and stuff like that. So that's kind of my role um, so far. And uh, it, it's, it's worked out really well. Well, that's cool. When you pitched, uh, you relied on a sinker at 89 and a split at 84 and a slider at 82. Well, according to Baseball Savant. <laughs> yeah. All right. And but you had great success for eight years in the big leagues, which right. is no no minor feat. Uh, you were mainly a long relief pitcher who was a ground ball specialist in, with your sinker. I noticed that according to Baseball Savant, uh, you tended to throw your slider down glove side and your split tended to be down arm side. Then your sinker tended to be middle middle. Mm-hmm. But you know, when they group all of the data for all your years into one thing, I don't think it gives a good picture. Uh, what was your general strategy with those three pitches? Yeah, so I didn't even start um, throwing my sinker until I got to pro ball, really. I, I was kind of a four-seam guy in college, and I, I gripped the ball really firm, and, and the seams in college are a lot bigger, and so they used to tear my fingers up. And once I got to pro ball and the seams kind of dropped a little bit with minor league balls, I started developing – a really good two seam. And um, I would say right off the bat, like what I really try to do, I tried to, I tried to glove side backdoor my two seamer, like yeah. to righties, I was basically trying to be off to on. And so that's yeah. where you're probably seeing a lot of some of that middle, you know, that's um, Ma- Maddox would do that. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. And so I grew up in Eastern North Carolina, I was a huge Braves fan growing up. And you yeah. basically are trying to, you know, those guys are trying to see how far off the plate we can get strikes. And I wasn't that much different. And um, yeah. the, uh, the optical illusion, if you will, of trying to hit an outside corner as the ball is coming back to that corner, you know, a lot of umpires would, uh, there's a lot of called strikes out there. And so I um, basically would just kind of, you know, try to do that. And then my, my slider um, was almost a sweeper before the sweeper, Um, you know, like it it was, you know, flatter. It would have been more of like a Frisbee type of thing, you know? Um, And so Mine was probably in the low low 80s, but it was uh, it, it was definitely a sweeper. So it's pretty much always getting to my glove side. You know, if I, if it's yeah. laying in the middle of the plate, I'm way behind the pitch. But um, 
Yeah, I was always getting to my glove side. And then you mentioned um, so my changeup was kind of like a split changeup, if you will, kind of like a kind of a three finger fork type of pitch that had kind of almost some top spin because I needed that extra depth to separate it from my. Yeah, it's hard to separate a changeup from a sinker. So you really got to kind of get some more of that top spin. And that's what my changeup ended up doing. And I was able to throw it, um, you know, predominantly to lefties, but also to righties uh, underneath their hands and stuff. But yeah, I was pretty much. I was trying to hammer the bottom of the zone and I was trying to work the ball off to on to righties and basically just ho- do whatever I could to lefties, you know, and, and yeah. throw the kitchen sink at them pretty much. The way I saw it based on my second book, a cutter would let him get lefties out. Right. You know, that was the missing pitch for getting lefties for, for a sinker ball slider guy. You know. Yeah. And looking at my career and everything and the data that we have now versus, you know, what we had when I was pitching the width yeah. of the slider does, you know, lead itself to having a, a, a more in between pitch. One of the things that might've been an issue for me, um, just the, the nature of the velocity difference and stuff like that, for, you know, when you're throwing 88 to 92 with a fastball to have a, a cutter that's hard enough to really be a cutter as opposed to just kind of more of a soft slider, but that would have definitely been something I probably should have tinkered with in my career. One of the things I struggled with is um, I was actually very an index finger dominant pitcher. So I would basically get the ball off my index finger where a lot of sinker ballers and guys are feeling the ball off of their middle finger as it's running that way. Um, I would actually break the nail on my index finger because I would, yeah. you know, bear on that side so hard and a yeah, slider. He has to be careful to manicure his fingernails. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. I mean, I've duct taped and stereo stripped my index finger, you know, so many times you wouldn't you wouldn't believe it. But to have the the feel for a slider or a cutter, like we were talking about, that's really more of a, a middle finger dominant pitch. And man, I just really, really struggled with it and probably never put the time in that I could have. Well, the other thing he has to do is to manicure his calluses. Mm-hmm. Because if he doesn't, they turn into a blister after a while. So yeah. you got to... As a pitcher, you know what I mean? You have to really be careful how your hands are. Yeah. While, while I while I would love to be pitching right now, still at 40 years old and everything, like the day I was done and not having to it's worry. It's about hard work. The, the day I was done and not having to worry about the the my fingernails was, you know, was a good day. I'll never forget when I was in the Florida State League once I got a blister, like you mentioned. And it was because I was in the I was in Brevard County um, in like the sixth or seventh inning. And I accidentally dunked my finger in the in the water the cup of water that I was oh. going to drink, you know, I picked it up and I think I dunked my finger and I got a blister that day. And so, oh. you know, just those, those little things like that. I mean, it's hot and humid there, you know, in Florida in the summer and just that extra whatever. And then I actually had to go on the, you know, uh, sit out a couple of games because I couldn't get that blister to, to heal. Yeah. It takes a while. You can build that callus back up and all yeah. that. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Everyone always talks about uh, max velocity all the time. Mm-hmm. And and the reason I started this show was to try to focus on things other than uh, that uh, to succeed as a pitcher, such as control, command, sequencing, mental training, and character. Uh, what would you say were your biggest strengths uh, that got you to pro ball and also kept you there for eight years, which is a major accomplishment? Yeah, so I, I think um, mine was a, a lot of movement. You know, obviously velocity was not the name of the game for me. I probably hit 94 miles an hour less than a dozen times in my entire life. You know, yeah, I don't think it's important. Right, and so the the nature of um, how I pitch was um, was was movement and location and command and and, and things like that. And um, it's funny, I was actually looking the other day. You're talking about. Yeah, we want to get swings and misses and all this stuff. And velocity obviously is one of the best ways to do that. But over the course of my career, kind of looking back at some of the advanced statistics that I look at, I was actually one of the highest in the league at called strike rate, which is not a metric for command, um, you know, but at the same point, I mean, I, I pulled it up today or something in my last four years in the major leagues, I think I was top, I was 99th percentile and you know, around guys like Bartolo Colon and Cliff Lee and guys like that in terms of getting called wow. strikes. So if you can throw your strikes, your your pitches in the strike zone and you're getting, you know, called strikes at a, a clip around 40 percent, you know, that's that's still going to drive success as well. So that was something that I tried to do. I wasn't trying to fool guys. You know, I wasn't trying to play keep away, but I just knew that with the, the movement I had on my pitches and mixing and matching and, and working to certain parts of the zone. I was a different look for for hitters 
which um, is something that's valuable in a bullpen today. We can't have all the same guy out there. And so when I come in, you know, with, with uh, my repertoire, it was something that was valuable and something that kept me around um, for, you know, almost a decade. Yeah. Uh, in my first book, one of the things I write about uh, using data for pitches was that <clears throat> what you want to be is not average. Right. Because batters are used to hitting the average. So you got just be different from average and you'll have mm -hmm. success, you know. I think that if they have to respect your fastball, even at, at, at 89, it makes your slider, your changeup, all your other pitches work even better because now they can't sit and take, you know? Right, for sure. And like that called strike rate for me is kind of a, a metric of, you know, overall deception. You know, everything in our game is deception. Velocity is deception. I can't see yeah. it, you know. Yeah, um, changing speeds, angles, everything, yeah. Yeah, everything is deception, and we're all trying, you know, our, our eyes play such an important role in the, in the game of baseball. You're just trying to glean information, and if you can't see the pitch because it's going really far, or it's not where you think it is because it's commanded really well, or it, this pitch moves different than anybody else's I've seen, you know. And so when you're kind of racking up those called those called strike rates like that, a cup, you know, like I said, I was in the you know upper 95th percentile for called strike rate and probably in the upper 85th percentile for ground ball rate. And those are the things, like you said, being out of the the, the average, you know, doing those for an, enough period of time. That's that's what keeps, you know, getting out because you, you don't have to be a freak, but there's certain things that you need to be elite at, you know, to be a, a major league pitcher. Well, I think sometimes they lose focus of what a pitcher's job is when they mm -hmm. just try to get strikeouts. To me, uh, the job of a pitcher is to get the most amount, most outs in the fewest amount of pitches. That's what I like. Right. A hundred percent. One of the things um, I try to impose on, on our guys is, and it's interesting because this is just kind of always how my brain worked. And you just kind of think that this is how everybody, you know, does stuff. But you know yeah, what they say when you, you know, they say when, when, when you assume, you know, and well, that's a really good point. We'll go off this tangent for a minute, but somebody said something to me about, I don't know, 30 years ago that really stuck with me. We were standing around and we were talking about physics. It's a friend of mine. As, as one does, right. Yeah, but what we were talking about, because and, and I was describing how I think, my process of thinking, and how I associate one thing to the other. I was describing it, and he said to me, no, that's the way you think. Mm-hmm. And that was a moment I always remember. It's like, ah, everyone has a different way of thinking. I, yeah. I never thought of it that way before. Right. The, the same thing plays into my job now when we're talking about players and, and you know, evaluating or the scent, whatever. And I think, ah, it's so simple. Should I even say that? Right. And it's kind of like, well, no, that's that's what they're paying you for. That's what your yeah. job is. And kind of back to the original point, like. I just assumed everybody was trying to get everybody out and all the every time they threw a pitch. Right. And so I trying to tell our guys, I'm like, if you're out there for a hundred pitches, how many are you using to try to get the batter out? You know, like, and realistically it should be 85 to 90 pitches, you know, like I'm going to try to get you out. And if I don't get you out here, I'm going to try to get you out. And if I get back into a two -hole hole, I'm going to try to get you out, you know, I try to set you up to get a put away pitch. Yeah. Right. Like I, I, I'm not trying to play keep away here. I'm trying to get you out and get you out and then get you out. But I can't get you out with a strikeout until I get to two strikes. So the the point, you know, I'll I'll tell our kids like, oh, oh, swings and misses that I don't, great. Right. But I don't love those because there's only so many swings and misses you're going to get in the game just by pure, you know, statistics. Well, one thing I noticed, too, there's a lot of guys uh, at 95 and higher. Right. They'll get maybe one or two strikes, a strike and a foul. Right. But they can't put a guy away. Right. Like you want and that to miss with two strikes, but in order to in order to get that, it, it's it's tough, you know. So like, and then um, if we're getting swings and misses, o o or one o or something, that kind of decreases our chances we might get swings and miss later in the game. And like you're saying, if we're trying to get all strikeouts and blow everybody away, it really minimizes. Yeah, you're gonna run out of. You're going to be out of the game. It minimizes the avenue for us to get hitters out. Yeah, because I think the ultimate stat to me is, did you win the game? Okay. All right. All right. And everything else is geared to that. And so, right. well, how can you win the game? Well, one thing you can do, I think, as a starting pitcher is to eat up a lot of innings. Get a, get a lot of outs with a lot less pitches with mm -hmm. least amount of runs. And then it gives – you know, if you bring in relievers, then they carry it on and you get a team win. Right. 
I, I like thinking of it a little bit in the inverse. So tell me what you think of this, Wayne. I like to think of, did you lose the game? Okay, because whether I win the game sometimes relates to did my bullpen hold the game for me as, you know, as the game progressed. Whereas as long as I stay ahead, you know, as long as we're giving up fewer runs than the other team has, you know, I can't lose the game, if that makes any sense. Um, oh, see, I, I always... Uh, I'm of I, I'm of the thinking that thoughts become things. So mm -hmm. I I don't want any negative thoughts. Like yeah, so, I, I'd agree with you there. But at the same point, so when I was in low A, I won 14 games. I went 14 and three. Now was I a product of those 14? I would say I was more a product of the three because when I left the game that season, I threw I had 26 starts or something, and the the number of times I left the game where my team was not ahead was minuscule, right? And so that's kind of giving my team, you know, there's plenty of games where I might give up four and we've got six, that's great, I need to hold them there. There's some games where we score two and it's my job to give up zero or one, you know? And so just the nature of those types of things, we had we had actually four guys on that staff that won, ended up winning 10 games, but some other ones had more losses, if that makes any sense. And so mm -hmm. it doesn't take anything to lose a game. You don't have to get a single out to lose a game, right? Like if I go yeah. out, you know, if I go out there and I walk four guys and we're losing one nothing and I do my job and I'm out of the game, like I can't get a win. You know, I, I'm going to get a loss. And so, again, yes, the team can come back and and erase that loss for you. But, um, yeah, staying ahead and like you said, knowing when to, um, you know, that battle and everything. And, and did I win the game? But like the inverse is also kind of like as long as I'm not losing the game, if that makes any sense or leaving the game losing. Well, that kind of. Uh, leads to another thing we were kind of uh, talking a little bit about is that say you're doing a pen before a game. Mm -hmm. I've seen guys who throw the worst pen of their life before right. the game, then come in and throw a no hitter. Right. Uh, someone that I mentioned to you before. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, I've seen guy, a similar player who threw the best pen of their life. They go into the game and they can't get through the first. Yeah. They get not, they get, they get rocked like in the yeah. first inning. And I kind of think that the latter is because if you have a bad pen, I'm just thinking, I'm guessing here, is that your focus is heightened. You're right. you're kind of like going on the, uh, you know, the custom auto when he talks about fear mm -hmm. and how to use fear. Fear can destroy you or you can use it to build things like use that fear. So uh, you get that fear or oh, that bad pen. Now you're heightened focus. And you wind up pitching a really good game then. That's what I think. Right. What, what do you think about that? I would say that, you know, nothing focuses the mind kind of like, you know, some, something like that. I, I'd agree. Yeah. I'd agree with that. Um, he describes a, a deer walking along the edge of uh, a forest. Mm -hmm. And the deer normally can jump three feet. Right. But now it gets to the forest. Now – a lion comes or whatever comes out, the wolf gets to try to get him. That deer, because of fear, that adrenaline, he could jump twice as far. Right. He's now used his fear to to actually excel in its performance, you know? Right. And, and, and the flip side, you know, if you're in the pen and you're spotting up and you're dotting up and your arm feels like amazing, right? It might be that here's one of here, here's a great day for me, right? Like I can let off the gas type of thing. And that, right, you become complacent, yeah. And that's when that that's where that mental training comes in, like you were talking about, and really keeping an even keel, whether we are having good stuff or or bad stuff. Um, when I when I played that's all important. the time, I would go back and watch my good outings and my bad outings. The pitches weren't moving that much differently. My locations might have been a little bit here and there, but really like where was my mental space? You know, like, was I, was I checked in? Was I ready to go or was I checked out and stuff like that? And so the well, good, what do you, what do you mean by that? Like, so, what, what would you feel? So when, when you're, you know, if I thought I was, had a great pen or whatever, I can check out. Right. Because like, we're just going to, I'm going to throw my glove out there and we're going to roll up, you know, six innings and give up nothing. Yeah, right? That's not that, that good. Yeah. <laughs> right. That's checking out because, you know, things are easy. We're rolling the ball downhill today. Whereas if you got to roll the ball uphill, you've got to focus a little bit more, you know? And so that's where some of that mental training comes in. I mean, the age old adage of, you know, you throw 30 starts in a game, 10, you're going to have terrible stuff. 10, you're going to have great stuff. And another 10, you're going to have somewhere in the middle, regardless of what the stuff we have that day, our mental preparation can be the same. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and so 
being, you know, sticking to our game plan, understanding our strengths and, and stuff like that and, and taking those things, um, you know, out there. And it, it's funny that first inning is just very important, um, you know, and it sets a tone. Yeah. Right. You can surprise yourself and everything. And, and so whether you're getting those thoughts in your head of like, oh, man, I just had a terrible pen, you know, using the fear to like, all right, let's get ourselves going versus the thoughts of like, man, today's going to be easy. You know, like you can't let those thoughts creep in either. So yeah. there, there, there's a yin and a yang to, you know, being underconfident versus being overconfident. Yeah. I think in uh, that pitch grader software I talked about, there's a stat that I have automatically calculated based upon a result after some uh, event. For example, if a pitcher gives up a home run, Mm-hmm. If he walks the next batter, I take away points. Right. If he strikes out, if he strikes out the next batter, he gets plus points. So, like, depending if uh, depending on what happened, I'm testing what happened after that kind of uh, event. It's, yeah, it's basically, almost kind of um, an intrinsic win probability chart, almost if you will, right? Like, and in, in, in baseball, there's so much there's there's so much momentum. You know, like we score. Like, let's not right. let them, let's not. Right. Let and that's, down. and that's mental. That, 100%. You know? Let's, you know, not every inning is the same, you know, um, it, like I said, like if you got a big lead and you give up a run, that's fine. But if you've got no lead and you give up a run, the feeling in that game is, is completely, completely different. And so I, I love what you're saying there with, you know, how can we score a run and then we go out and we have a first pitch, first batter, four pitch walk, you know, that type of stuff is just killer for, you know, the team and just for the momentum yeah. and, and rolling things up and these things in baseball, they just, they, they build on each other. You know what I mean? And in, in baseball, there's a lot of slang. When I say command, uh, someone else might say locating or ex- executing mm-hmm. or quality strikes. Uh, I think they need to know those are words for command uh, to compound that there's no easy way to measure command in a game. Right. Uh, in training, you can with command tracker, that target I made, but that wasn't around till this year. I see a lot of people online who mistake command and control all the time. To me, control is the ability to throw strikes, plain and simple. Command to me is the ability to throw the ball where you choose, in or out of the zone. Even the great video game like MLB The Show doesn't even have a command level. They mm-hmm. just have a control level. Right. Uh, how would you describe control? And how would you describe command? Yeah, I mean, I, I would say control and, and, and looking at this through a front office lens, you know, like basically like control is just a much bigger macro uh, statistic. Like we base can control grading on how many guys you walk per nine. That has no, that has no great bearing on whether you um, can access certain parts of the zone. It's basically just, can you, can you get it in the, the top of the funnel? Right. And c- yeah. control is, is, um, you know, at the top of that funnel and then command is as we get further down, you know, that funnel and everything, can we throw multiple pitches in multiple locations and stuff like that? And not only that, but then can we throw them at the right time? I think control is very um, black and white uh, and command. You can slice it all the different ways, you know, can I throw a curveball in this part of the the zone after I threw a fastball in that part of the zone, or can I just yeah. generally throw a fastball in that part of the zone and, or fun or funnel your pitches to get deception? Yeah. 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 Can, can I, I mean, we see so many times where we're throwing bullpens and guys are throwing fastball, 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 but it's like, then they throw this curveball, and it's like, there's no point in the game where we're throwing, you know, ho- hopefully not that many fastballs. It's can I throw my fastball and then my curveball and can I access these different parts of the zone and manipulate these things as, um, you know, in tandem with each other. And so it's, it's just very much slicing those things down um, to, I think of control as like, you know, big motor groups, you know, and command is, is fine motor groups. Yeah. You know, and also pitching to an advanced scouting report too. I think you yeah. have to have command to be able to do that. Right. You know, when I see uh, videos along about how to improve command, I find they're again, still working on control that's throwing strikes. Of course you need to have control to start, but how would you have worked on command like when you started? So one of the things for me and like I never, you know, in order to find who you are as a pitcher, like that really happened for me when I was in when low in, in West Michigan, um, ended up winning Tigers minor league pitcher of the year. But like I didn't know I was a sinker. Wow. Baller. I didn't know that I was a guy that really needs to limit walks. You know, like I had probably my strikeouts per nine were in the sevens ish in college and, and in, in short season and my walks were pretty good. 
but my walks just took a plummet, you know, once I got there, once I got to the big leagues, you know, I, I was walking not, you know, less than two guys per nine or, or, or whatever, because I, because I had to, but one of the things that actually really helped me was just my low a year. Um, my catch partner was a guy named Luke French who ended up getting to the big leagues with uh, the Tigers and was actually traded for Jared Washburn to the Mariners. And we would play catch and we would just count how many times we threw the ball above each other's shoulders. And so until, until like we that. Had... yeah, emo was, emo was talking about that the other day and catch right. plays very until starting we, point until we got out to 90 feet. And once we were past 90 feet, you know, we kind of gave, you know, it's a little bit tougher, but once we got to 90 feet, we would keep track. Cause you know, if I could get on top of the ball and, you know, have my fingers in the right place and get it, you know, I mean, the strike zone isn't that much different than what your torso is. Yeah. And if, you know, if I'm working on that type of stuff and just those fine motor skills, and if I can throw, you know, hit you in the chest from 85 feet, that, you know, should give me a good idea that I can hit a target from, you know, 60 feet, six inches. And so that was yeah. the first thing for me of kind of like working those things. The other thing I would say in the difference between control and command for me, I'm very much, you know, a perfectionist type person. So probably maybe too far on one side, but also when, when I'd throw my bullpens, I'd be a stickler for my locations, you know, this to this is a difference, right? Yeah. In terms of where the, where the catcher is catching the ball or where, where we're hitting the ball. Especially, on the, especially for a sinker baller, 100%. you know, messing up is uh, going to get launched. A hundred, a hundred percent, you know? And so um, when I threw my pins, I wouldn't be satisfied with here if I wanted to be here, you know, if that makes any sense. And so I knew yeah. where, um, my low A pitching coach, Matt, or my low A coach, Matt Walbeck, um, who pitched in the, or played in the big leagues for a, a long time, and our pitching coach, AJ Sager, would always say, like, they'll, and again, this is for me because I was a sinker ball pitcher, they'll let you know where down is, right? Like, the hitter will let you know where down is because mm -hmm. you'll be able to see it. Like, if I'm down with my sinker, I'm going to get chops and ground balls and all kinds of things. And the same exactly. Can be said, yeah, the same can be said today for guys with more carry, they'll let you know where up is, right? Like if you're getting fly yeah. balls and you're getting swings and misses, like you're probably where you, and it, you're probably where you need to be. But there's a lot of times where we think up is basically just, you know, above middle. Right. And like, that's not, that's not, or we'll, they'll let you know where in is, or they'll let you know where away is and stuff like that. So the hitter is going to give you a lot of information. And for me, it was, let me find where down is, right. Let me find where down is. Yeah. That, that's been said uh, a few times on the show that, uh, the bat the batters let you know if your pitches are any good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's and, true. I mean, that, that's where the money's made, Wayne. That's where the money's made, man. As our good friend Emo says, make better pitches instead of trying to make your pitches better. I think players are focusing too heavily on stuff and not enough on where their current stuff plays. So first we need to describe what a good or better pitch is. Now, to me, a good pitch is, depends on the previous pitch or the, what the next pitch or the field situation, what the batter did. Uh, how would you describe what makes a good pitch? Like, say you're pitching, and how would you know when you made a good pitch or not? So, like, what's, what's a thought process? Yeah, for me, like, just whether I, again, like I said, I was very much a stickler for am I hitting that, that target exactly where I need to be, you know, type of stuff. Um, now, I think there's oh, obviously... Well, no, but if we back up, how did you know what target you wanted to hit? Uh, with that's a, pitch? Yeah, that's a good point. So again, like I think the the hitters just kind of are, are telling you that type of stuff. You know, you've got to know that your OO slider is not the same as your O2 slider and stuff like that. And so well, how, how so? Well, I mean, I've just got to work in bigger parts of the zone and then I can expand and stuff like that. And that's where working with your catcher and stuff. I'm I was such a stickler for where my catchers were setting up and everything. And like, yeah. I wanted guys to move and to be here. And like, that's where, like, for me, I would lose balls to my arm side away to lefties. And so I would make sure to tell my catchers like, Hey, you got to hang on the plate more, like really give me middle and let me work to that corner. Cause if you give me the corner, I'm going to run the, I'm going to run the ball off or and the, the opposite was true. When I went to extension side, I'm like, get out there, you know, like get out there. Um, actually the current um, Cubs manager, David Ross, when I would, um, playing for Boston, he would catch me and man, there'd be times he was so far out there. But like, if I, I, I almost had no chance to hit him, but if I reached out there and he caught the ball coming back over the plate, there were strikes, you know, and the, the opposite was true for me going to my arm side and stuff like that. So you got to kind of know 
those things and, and, and understand because a, a good target for me was, was kind of everything. So understanding where your stuff plays, understanding where you're getting those, the weak contact and the swings and miss and stuff like that. And it just takes reps. Yeah. Well, let's say, let's say you have a, uh, you're a righty right. and a right-handed batters at the plate. Uh, you throw a slider and now he's, he's hunting it. So you throw mm -hmm. the second slider, you see is going over the plate. What are you throwing to him next? Right. I'm probably, uh, Honestly, for uh, so what's the count? Is it 02? Is it 1 1? What is well, let's it? Let's say you, you're throwing two sliders in a row. It's it's now, uh, let's say it's 1 1 now because the first slider he he swung and missed. The second right. one you went further out and he didn't he didn't uh swing, he kind of lunged at it, right? So for me, I mean, I that's where I could kind of win and go with my sinker because if I can get the ball, you haven't seen my sinker yet, right? And if yeah. I can get the ball to the 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 lower part of the zone right number one and this is another thing we talk about um command it's funny you mentioned like making better pitches you know versus making your pitches better but a lot of times when you make better pitches you also make your pitches better when i get to the bottom of the strike zone with my sinker they tend to have better action right when i'm yeah. up in the strike zone they're they're a little bit flatter and more side to side so they kind of it's a compounding effect in, into the positive positive end so for me in that situation, I'm trying to get my sinker just down. And if I can get it down in a way, I'm going to give you a single to right field pretty much, you know, but if I can get that ball down over the middle of the plate, there's a really good chance either you're taking it or you're grounding out to shortstop. So that's kind of where yeah. I would go. Yeah. And nowadays, you know, if, if you're just shooting for keeping the ball in the park, Right. That's that's going to be good because they're trying to hit out of the park all the right. time. And, kind of, and that that's that's where I relied on a lot in my career. Like you mentioned, I was like more of a long reliever coming in in long spots and getting guys that were, you know, looking to pad their stats or not spending as much time, whatever. I wanted guys that were trying to hit the ball at the ballpark, you know, because I, yeah. I want nothing more than you to try to pull the ball, especially as a right handed hitter. Yeah. And I want you to roll that roll that ball over to shortstop like you were saying. Um, and as we alluded to earlier, so one, one, I'm not trying to strike the guy out. I'm trying to get you out, you know, and I think I can get you out with that sinker. And if that gets me to one, two, now I have a variety of avenues to get you out, whether I really want to strike you out or, or go someplace else. I, Cause now that I've thrown the sinker, I can go back to the sinker. I can go to the slider. I can expand with the slider. I can throw you the, you know, kind of the split change up more middle, middle that's, you know, off of the sinker and, and stuff like that. Yeah. Cause I, I've always used the sinker as something you would use kind of mainly arm side unless you could do a a, a a glove side on the black too right yeah yeah I, and I and again like that was something I probably should have worked with more with keeping my front side closed longer I, I think of a guy like Jared Hughes who's a very good sinker baller for a long time and he was just very front side closed and he would hammer that down and arm side in and that wasn't me I almost flew too much open with my top half to to get to that you know, comeback sinker and everything. And so that was something that eluded me for a bit and probably was something I should have worked on better. Yeah. Well, from the guys you saw and, and from your own experience, what would you say were kind of the qualities that led to guys having better command than others? Was it like head stillness or like you just described with your arm? I, I think um, easy so one of the things like command's going to come for you sometime, right? So like you can either get the velocity and search for the command later, or we can get the command and search for the velocity later. Right. Yeah. You know, it's going to, it's, it's hard to pitch in the major leagues and you don't throw, you can absolutely get to the major leagues. If you don't throw strikes, the chances of you staying in the major leagues for a long time, if you don't throw strikes are pretty small, you know, they're, yeah. they're just, it's like, just as they say, it might get you there. Velocity. Yeah, get you there. Right. But like, eventually everyone's going to throw and, and velocity is, is easier to attain, you know, now more than ever, as we've kind of hacked some of the, you know, the biomechanics and stuff. And a lot of outside groups are doing a really good, good job with that. But yeah. Um, you know, you're like to find that that command and, and everything like you're eventually going to have to be able to locate your your pitches and, and stuff like that. Like with everyone throwing hard nowadays, it seems command is now the separator. That right. velocity was the separator at high levels, but now it's not like you remember that guy, White Lightning, Steve Dalkowski. I do not. That is not a name that's familiar to me, Wayne. Yeah, well, he he was they thought he threw 110. Uh -huh. I never made it out of the minor leagues because he couldn't even control it, let alone command it. 
and I, I described all high velo and no command as having all gas and no brakes. <laughs> right. It'll only take you so far, you know? Right. So what I try to do on this show is to encourage people to, uh, like you said, develop velocity, develop command, develop your mental toughness and strategy. Right. Uh, a, a character, I think, is important to carry you through difficult times and, and easy times, like you said, keep an even right. keel, you know? Yeah, for sure. So like one of the things in the scouting and you're talking about that is like, you go ahead and grade the individual parts of a pitcher. And if we've got a guy that's got 70 grade velocity, right? Like he's 98, 99, you know, the, the scale is only increased, you know, so, 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 so yeah. much now, but if you've got 70 grade velocity and you've got 30 grade control, you know, and command, you know, you split the difference there and that doesn't make your fastball a 50 fastball, right? Necessarily like the, 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 the parts of those things don't always just, you split the middle and that's a major league average fastball. If you can't get your fastball in the zone, you can't get that velocity to even play. It goes back to what we talked about earlier, which is uh, the job of a pitcher is to get outs. Right. And if you throw 98 and can't get outs, it, it doesn't work for anybody. So right. you kind of have to develop all those skills. And as we're seeing more guys develop velocity, we're seeing guys that, have differing 98s right like a lot like when i first came up 98 yeah, you just don't see 98 and that was fine but now there's different extension to 98 different carry to 98 different action to 98 and some guys will get by with 95 that looks like 98 and some guys 98 looks like 93 and everything yeah it depends on your delivery your deception how you right. hide the ball everything which yeah. goes back to your thing of like we don't really want to be average so now 98 might be 98 on the gun but it plays pretty average and so um that that's where then you know as you get up the ladder to the big leagues and everything those separators you know are are, are more the things that you just mentioned did you ever do any uh mental training for command like we always heard the stories about Dorfman working with uh, Holiday and Maddox. Mm -hmm. And uh, like Holiday, I had Gil Patterson on. He was his pitching coach uh, when they sent him down because mm -hmm. uh, he had the highest ERA of any any major leaguer right. uh, over 100 innings. They sent him down. They chained his arm slot, which was overhead at 98. Mm -hmm. They put him at high three-quarter. And then Dorfman worked on his mental – uh, skills like because he was giving up a lot of runs and getting a lot of pressure because of that right and then you know when he came back he became a hall of fame pitcher that we all know right yeah Have so, you done anything like that so mental the, the 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 mental game is what really separated it for me so and i, I preach that on our, our our minor league kids like everybody's got talent really and the ability to stay up in the major leagues and everything is really more it's a lot more up in there now. Um, so when I got to short season, when I was drafted and everything, I didn't really have much mental training. Um, I tend to be kind of like a paralysis by analysis type guy, a lot of overthinking and stuff. Um, my first off season, I don't know who gave it to me or who recommended it, but I read the book Heads Up Baseball by Ken Revisa. Um, I'm mm -hmm. not sure if you're familiar with Ken, but like a long time kind of sports psychologist i think he had worked um for the angels and stuff as well it's it's this awesome book it's kind of like a workbook looking thing it's got manny ramirez like when he was with the indians you wouldn't even rec recognize him anymore i think the wow. new one has anthony rizzo on the cover but it was just a lot of basic mental skills and mental preparation yeah. stuff and it really got me from overthinking to thinking basic basics and then when I, I would basically take that into my starts and had kind of mental preparation routines, um, whether it be visualization or, or things like that, or understanding when I was getting into kind of some negative self-talk as somebody that can tend to be kind of a perfectionist, like you're driven a lot by not wanting to make mistakes and everything. But as you said, those thoughts become things. And so if I'm thinking negatively all the time and there's a difference between trying to avoid a mistake versus trying to, you know, do something positively. And so once I kind of developed that more of that mental toughness, I that's when I kind of sh shot off and shot up and got out of my own way, essentially, um, coupled with the fact of kind of, like I said, developing that sinker, which really allowed me, number one, the mental skills gave me toughness to get in the zone. Right. right. And then the sinker allowed me to kind of really, really open it up from there. But if you're scared to throw strikes, you're not going to be a very good pitcher yeah. and you can have great command and control. 
but that can completely get in your way, you know, and, and, and everything like that. So you have to believe in yourself, you know, yeah. that's probably one, I think one of the bigger things for pitchers, uh, number one is mm -hmm. to know who you are. Right. And, and then to believe in yourself, you know, right. you know, knowing what makes you unique and special, just like you said, and working on that to become uh, great at it. Right. Uh, another thing I always say is uh, that visualization. I had read some studies, uh, that they had done with people throwing darts. Have you ever read those? Oh, uh, no, but I, I, I'm, I'm curious. Well, what they did was they took a groups of people that uh, some people had thrown darts before, were good at them. Some never threw darts. And what they split up in groups and they, they had some uh, practice throwing darts for like a couple weeks. Yeah. They measured before and after. They had some that they had done no practice at all. And they did nothing, all right? And they had another group, no practice at all, but they visualized throwing the dart. They, mm -hmm. they visualized in their mind throwing a dart and hitting a spot. They did that for a few. Then they measured the three groups at the end. The group that mentally visualized and did practice actually had an improvement on their skills for throwing darts. Mm -hmm. And I did a couple studies did this. So what it shows you is that that visualization in your mind actually can help. Uh, it makes an improvement. Right. A hundred percent. So like kind of on the flip side, when you're watching a scary movie, right? Like, you know, you're sitting in your living room, but you're like legitimately scared, right? Because you're, you don't, your, your brain is just seeing these images, right? And it, yeah. it's, it's having a reaction. So like you're saying the ability to have that, that positive visualization, it's funny because I would get our lineup when I was a starting pitcher and I would, go through everybody and I would sit there and I, you know, would try to visualize myself making the pitches. Right. And like, I'm sitting there and we're playing the Sarasota Reds and I'm, you know, Jay Bruce is hitting third for them. And I'm thinking to myself and like, I'll, I'll visually throw him a change up and he'll get a hit. Right. <laughs> and so I'll, I'll mm -hmm. think, okay, okay, let's back up and we'll race it. Now make the other pitch. Okay. Now I saw myself. Okay. Yep. He rolled that one over or like, Oh, I made a different pitch or something and we popped him up, but just like having those mental reps, gives yourself some, you know, calmness that you can, if, you know, this guy doesn't know any different, right? Like, so if I've yeah. gone ahead and done in a time or two, you know, mentally, then once I'm locked in, I, it's it's very much easier to do it out there. And our game is so driven by, by our eyes, you know, and everything. So if you can see yourself doing it, it's easier for you to see yourself doing it, if that makes any yeah, sense. Yeah. And I think that's a little twist on what I was talking about. And Another area that I think we were talking about AI and scouting the other day, right. a few episodes. And I was describing uh, Richard Feynman, the physicist. He was talking about uh, people asked him, do you think computers will, will be the think like humans? Mm -hmm. And he was he said, well, they won't. They'll think, but not the way we think, meaning that you have airplanes that fly, but they don't fly exactly like a bird does. They, they fly, but differently. He says, for example, uh, a computer, a, a human, you could see uh, your wife 300 yards away. You can barely make her out, but she flicks her hair a certain way. You know that's your wife. Mm -hmm. Just by a little flick. Uh, computers don't have the information in and the knowledge to know that kind of little subtle thing. So like, mm -hmm. for example, when you pitched to Jay Bruce, uh, you may have subconsciously thought about and watched his, his at-bats and can see what pitches work with him. But you may not really consciously think about it. But when you play it in your mind, you're probably calling out these subtle cues. Oh, that's not the right pitch for him. Right. Uh, that's what I think. You know? Yeah, 100%. And I think like the little things that you might pick up on, like I'd really watch guys' feet, you know, and, and, and everything like that and just kind of get a what would you What would you watch with their feet? Just where, where their direction's going and kind of, you know, like really like lower half and feet and stuff like that. Because you can get an idea of how comfortable guys are there, if that makes any sense. So um, like when I was, uh, say I was facing Jose Batista, right, with the Blue Jays, and I would throw him comeback sinkers and there'd be one and he would step out there to go hit it, right, and, and take it. And I know, though, that the pitch actually started on the black and kind of ended up in the outer third, right? So I knew I had more to go. So I could take it off a little bit now. Now I'm going off to on, 
And I knew right. he kind of stepped out there to get it. And he thought, and, you know, he's kind of shaking his head like, yeah, that ball, he thinks that ball, the first one was like right on the black. And now I can go a little bit further out there, Wayne, oh, yeah. and getting that strike. And now the guy does, now he's, you know, irate because he's like, I thought the last one was on the black. Now, where is this one? And now, now we're doing, now we, you know, don't, and now, now also we're looking this way because we're yelling at the umpire. And so those, those are, you know, those are like little subtle cues uh, of, of, of how, how you can pitch. But yeah, I mean, you can see guys and, and how they're fouling the ball off and things like that. And those are things, you know, if guys are fouling the ball straight back, you know, you've got a good sinker that day. You know, if guys are, it's just reading those swings and those nuances, like you said. That, well, that, that, that. Yeah, let's let's say you got a right-handed batter and he, he, he fouls your sinker straight back. Okay, mm -hmm. you know that your sinker's working. Well, straight and, back over his bat or straight back under his bat? Because those are two well, different. Well, let's, let's take both of them. Let's say the over, what happens? What is he oh, doing? Over it, I know he's right on it. And I know that's not a good pitch. And I know that I probably need to be down and, and maybe I need to go to another pitch. So, and, and under it, it, it gives me confidence because it knows that I can actually throw a worse pitch and get a better result, if that makes sense. Yeah. If I'm throwing my nastiest sinker and they're just chopping the ball foul off the plate, I almost want you to hit it, you know? like Yeah, because you know you're going to weak pitching. grounder, yeah. Right, and like what that's also a thing that I try to kind of impress on some of our kids is like, know that bad foul balls, you can make a worse pitch and you're going to get a better better result, you know what I mean? Like if if somebody's way late on a pitch, like, you know, you you don't have to throw it. Either you can throw it harder and get it by as bad or you can locate it a little bit better and take something off and, and still have a good positive result. Wow. Let's say that same right-handed batter, he fouls your sinker off to the first base side. Okay. What do you think he's doing there? So he's probably trying, oh, well, there's a difference of, is he trying to go that way and that's why he fouled it off or is he behind the ball and like he's trying to pull pull the ball and he's kind of backsiding that ball. So oh. if, if he's pulling off and he's backsiding that ball, you know, like kind of getting the backside of the barrel, but everything's going this way, that lets me know I can probably throw him a slider because he's already pulling off and now I can get that pitch way further there. But if wow. he's trying to go that way, then that, that now opens me up to get, get in close, closer to him. Oh, and so if he's pulling it foul, right. Then so what are you going to If he's pulling the ball foul, then again, that's another thing too. Like I can probably sweep a, a slider away, away from him, or I can actually throw something slower, like my change up. Yeah. I was going to think change up. Yeah. Right. And so, you know, again, the change up, his eyes will probably light up like, ah, oh, I got one. Yeah. And if I can <laughs> get that to him, he's either going to swing over top of it and miss it, or it's a ground ball, to, ground ball to shortstop or something, or, or not a comfortable pitch for him, you know? Yeah. Uh, Emo was on a few episodes ago talking about a lot of people don't think you can throw a sinker up in the zone. He mm -hmm. says you can mm -hmm. just got to hit the top of the zone with it. Yeah. Did you ever try throwing your sinker up? Not on purpose, but I definitely know that I had success with it. And it's funny because watching the Rangers game the other day, they mentioned that for Jordan Montgomery, that he's actually been oh, actively did? trying to throw the ball in the top of the zone. It's funny because when I was in Boston, I had pretty good, I don't know, I just had pretty good action on my sinker the whole year and I'd get rid of, get away with a lot of pitches in the upper part of the zone. So I would call them aquarium sinkers, Wayne, because they'd come in from the top, right? They, they, <laughs> and it's, it's tough to hit because really you can't get on top of that pitch, if that makes any sense. You know, when we're in the middle, those things kind of flatten out. But if I'm going top yeah. to bottom, it's almost kind of like the high curveball, right? Like, if the curveball starts out high and clips the top of the zone, like it's really hard to square that, that type of a pitch up. So, I mean, it's all about those angles and stuff and probably something. Yeah. I mean, again, 10 years ago, probably should have looked into that a little bit more. <laughs> and, well, that's another thing. When I was looking at pitches too, on a sinker, I noticed that there were different sinkers. For example, one that I call a runner. Mm -hmm. It's like uh, you're trying to throw a sinker. It's going uh, down in the arm side. Mm -hmm. But if you get on the side too much, it tends to more run right. to the arm side. Right. Did you ever use that kind of technique? Kind of like, I call it using a rudder for your sinker. I would you know? say my sinker, the movement on that day was maybe a little bit more inherent and tougher to manipulate sort of, but I needed to be aware of how it was moving. There's probably some days where everything was running a lot. And there's probably some yeah. days where everything was sinking a lot. On the majority of days, mine was kind of doing both. I would say the, the rudder nature of it would be more for my slider. Um, it's interesting because 
there'd be some days where I'm like, man, this is what it needs to be. And it's right and sharp there. I remember, um, you know, Wade Davis, who was a far better pitcher than me. And I was lucky enough to play with in Tampa uh, Bay. And we would say some of the same, we'd say the same things, but we have obviously very different results because he had nitro stuff. But he's like, there's some days I can throw my slider and it feels like a cutter and it's sliding. There's other days I feel like I got to crank on this thing and throw it like a curveball just to get well, it to well, move. I'm glad you mentioned that too, because I was studying, uh, the second book I wrote was Baseball Pitches. And I kind of dissected uh, how pitches are based upon the data and irregardless of what the pitcher called it. Right. So based only on the movement. And what I noticed too was that when guys threw a slider, mm -hmm. like a gyro slider really hard, it moves like a cutter. Right. So I figure if you throw a slider really hard and it moves like a cutter, I'm not calling it a slider. Right. Yeah. It's, you could basically, yeah. and, and we have some guys like this with the Arizona, um, like Luis Frias is a guy like, like we have that um, really high overhead slot, but throws a cutter, but the nature of the high overhead slot gives it depth, almost like it's a slider. Right. Whereas yeah. for me, I'm throwing from over here that's not going to have any depth and that's, you know, it's a much the, the, the nature of how the ball is spinning might be identical. However, they're coming from completely different release points, which is going to make the overall trajectory of the pitch different. So I like what you're saying. Like, I don't care what the pitcher calls it, right? Like I'm just yeah. going to classify on how it's moving. Yeah. Because uh, when I started in baseball, I was using the data for pitch grader and there was a guy in a college that I won't say who was known for his slider. Mm -hmm drafted on a slider mm -hmm. so i thought well he's got such a great slider i have to know everything about the slider because i want to know what a good slider is right i'm the kind of guy that just dives in all in on something right and the more i looked at his slider the more i thought well this moves like a power curve if, if, if at best right and then it dawned on me when i was talking to emo uh well yeah everybody knew he threw a great slider they all talked about his great slider. The batters knew a great slider was coming, and they swung at it like a great slider. Mm -hmm. Now, being a power curve, that's why they all missed it. Right. <laughs> yeah, which makes sense. Um, so we've got a guy in our our pen, uh, Andrew Solfrank, a lefty, who throws like a really hard power curve ball, but like you might probably say it's a slider. Um, I'm real good uh, buddies with Andrew Miller, who basically threw a hard, low slot power curveball, right? But it, right. it kind of looked like a slider. We've got, uh, we had another guy that pitched for us this year, Jose Ruiz, who literally would throw a spiked curveball that moved like a hard slider. You know, like the nature, you don't see spike sliders really, but like the nature of the pitch was really more of a slider. It definitely is not deep enough to be a curveball, but he called it a curveball. And it would sometimes yeah. tag as a curveball. Yeah, so in the beginning of that second book, I talk about that these pitches are classified not by how the pitcher intended to throw them at all, right. not by how they were gripped. Uh, for example, like even a two seam, I describe as not a pitch. It's right. a technique. The yeah, two it's, seam, you know, it, it's, it's the it's the start of the process, right? It, it's a grip. It has nothing to do with how the ball moves. I mean, sure. it does, but it's not describing how the ball moves because grabbing it on two seams, you can make the ball move all sorts of ways. Right. And, and from an evaluation standpoint, from a scouting standpoint, an 83, an 83 or 84 mile an hour slider, not overly impressive. An 83 or 84 mile an hour curveball, much more impressive, right? Yeah. And so like there's varying degrees of, of of what you're calling it. You know, it might look like this, but actually be that. And so it should be, um, you know, thought of, of accordingly. Yeah, just like high school guys, you can see what I would call, you know, cement mixer or gravity curveballs, right? Right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> They're not really curveballs. And, and from a scouting point of view or a coaching point of view, if you know what the guy is really throwing, you know whether you have to really teach him a whole new pitch or how, or just help him refine his pitch. Yeah, absolutely. And those are two different levels of work, right? Mm -hmm. uh -huh. I also, at the end of the show uh, – I have a list of uh, nine different qualities that I think are needed for a pitcher. Mm -hmm. you, you may think there are more, and if there are, let me know. What I do is I put the list up, and you pick the top four that you think are, okay. are, are the best. Now, of course, if you had a pitcher, you would say, I want all nine. So right. the hard part is to pick you know, the nine that you uh, think are the top. All right, so here is a list. I'm going to read them out for people who are listening. Uh, okay. Uh, the, the one is character, 
command, changing speeds, movement, max velocity, sequencing, reading batters, mental toughness, and know who you are. All right, so I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna have to cheat here, Wayne. So I'm gonna start with nine with know who you are because I think that encom that encompasses a lot of all these other categories, right? If I know yeah. who I am, I know what my command is. I know I know whether I'm good or not at changing speeds. I know my movement and stuff like that. So I think that's the most important. Um, I would say the the next I would put we'll put you know command and max velocity kind of next because as I said, like you're gonna nowadays you're going to need some of both and it's yep. going to, you know, velocity is going to come for you at some point or command is going to come for you at some point. And so, yep. um, as we've mentioned, it's it, guys have really been focused on velocity, but as more guys are focused on velocity, more of that velocity becomes average and stuff. And so now you've got to find other things that, that separate. Yeah. yeah. And so then I think the last one I would say probably is reading batters. Um, just because again, like that's, as we said, that's where that's the outcome, you know, and that's, there's so much feedback that processes into that feedback loop of what I'm going to throw next, which then factors into sequencing and, and, and stuff like that. So those are, those are the four I'm, I'm throwing in my, uh, my toolbox and taking with me. Yeah. I think that reading batters is a, a real skill that, uh, unlike what you did before, a lot of people don't really get really into, like people will say, I know how to read the batters and if it falls out like you actually describe some specific cases of how to read a batter right which i don't think are really explicitly talked about too much you know right again everything's information right like we're just trying to glean information the hitter's trying to glean information from me and i'm trying to glean information from them and you can you know everything everything that they're showing you is 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 a, a roadmap into potentially how to get them out yeah, I think it's an exchange for every pitch you throw, you're giving the batter information. And every time he swings or takes, he's giving you information. Absolutely. And it's kind of, of a battle of wits and a battle of command because you can know what to throw. Then you have to have the ability to execute and so command I, it. I, one of the things, so in terms of a battle of wits, yes, but at the same point, like I never, I, I don't want to, that's never trying to outsmart a batter, right? Like it's, it's oh, no, no, it's just, yeah, it's, it's a dance, you know? Right. A, a, so that it's funny that you should mention that. So like, I always talk about the dance, like we got to learn the dance steps. Right. And we've yeah. got to understand which, you know, or for some guys I'll talk about Tetris or Legos or whatever. We've got to find the pieces that fit together to, to make this puzzle. And, um, you know, I, I, I actually really like what, what you said there with the dance, because, just those things is that that what that's what leads to the overall you know competing batter versus pitcher and it, it's just so unique unique in this game and and so not just like outwitting like you said but it's also it's adapting it's yeah. you know you give me this it's no different than when a nba player gets the ball on the wing and he takes that jab step right mm -hmm. he's he's giving the defender information and then the defender is giving him information, like whichever way he move, the defender moves is whatever the next move that's going to be made and vice and vice versa. And so those things happen really fast and you got to pick up on them. Well, I'm glad you said it because it's another thing I would have been talking about. Uh, I call them pitch gambits. Okay. For example, uh, uh, boxers have combinations uh, in the martial arts. They have patterns. Right. Uh, and I always thought that pitchers ought to have, and I think they do, uh, combinations of pitches that are used in certain situations in that right. if the pitchers practice those and had them in their back pocket for the situation when the batter uh, fouls my sinker off on the plate, I know what I got to do next. Right. Not be predictable, but know what my, my best options are. I have a one, two, three best option. Yeah. Uh, how do you, have you ever thought of those kind of things? Oh, a hundred percent. And so, especially for me, uh, I could kind of go strength on strength, right on right, right? Like I could, you could know sinkers are coming and hopefully you're going to take a bunch of sinkers and you're going to hit it into the ground 60% of the time. Yeah, right? yeah, for you, you want them to hit it. Go ahead, swing at it. hundred you know? percent. But to lefties, that game was different for me. Like I, like I said, by the end of my career, I was probably throwing 30% sinkers and throwing a lot of split changeups and a lot of sliders and stuff like that. So yeah, one you of, needed a cut. You needed a cutter for I lefties. I did. I did. I did. Wayne. we needed to have this conversation a, a lot longer, long before zoom was invented, I'm, I'm guessing, but <laughs> Um, those combinations, like you're saying, like the boxer has a combination for me, one was a backdoor slider to lefties, 
So I had the big kind of sweeper to lefties and I knew that I could either start him off with one. And if I could get it there, it pretty much was a, a called strike, you know, mm-hmm. or if I hadn't used it in an at bat, I could end up in an at bat with it, you know, and now, now granted I could rarely use it twice in the same at bat. Okay. Because then we can get guys kind of diving and it wasn't, it was big enough and movement enough and everything. So like, I knew I, I had a chance to, to use it once. Right. And so mm-hmm. if I, number one, if I didn't use it, that was, usually not great because that was one of my better offerings, but then you got to know how to work off of that pitch. Like you're saying, like, yeah, that dance. If, if this happens, if I don't hit my spot and right. I hit it up over here, now where do I go from there? What, what right. pitch? Did, like, does that open, like, you know, did he, did he see it? Did, Cause some guys just wouldn't see it. They'd be like, that ball's, that ball's in the third base coach's box. Right. And then it, and then it sneaks in their back door, you know? So does that la- lead me to believe that, I can then throw him a changeup because he thinks going to think so fastballs next. Or did he look out there and he wanted to do and he fouled it off and that opens up a sinker, a front door sinker for me on the inside and stuff like that. So like, yeah, you've got to understand the nature of the combinations, but it very much, very much is a dance. Yeah. I, I had a few conversations with a few uh, major league pit, uh, hitting coaches. Mm-hmm. Uh, I won't say who they are. And we kind of picked each other's brains on pitching and hitting and, one of the things I got from one of them was that some of the batters were uh, basically focusing on lanes. Okay. Like if you see my if you see my target, you know I had those squares for each area. They would pick a lane, mm-hmm. and if it wasn't in their lane, they ain't swinging. Right. And I thought, well, if I see a guy like that, I kind of know how I'm going to pitch him. Uh, if you don't notice that, you might be in trouble. <laughs> right. You know? For sure. And so, kind of understanding what lanes are your strength versus what are his weakness that gives you, you know, in terms of the game planning, like you mentioned, that gives you a good place to start, but then also understanding, you know, how the, the hitter is aggressive in, in certain spots and, and not. So. Yeah. That advanced scouting uh, is very helpful. Yeah, absolutely. You know? I mean, nowadays, even in the minor leagues, uh, I know they get like a little piece of paper, put it in a hat and it's got mm-hmm. all the heat maps. Right. Uh, or the uh, locations for each batter, so they could look in their hat and know where, where the zones are. Could you imagine what that would have been for you when you were starting yeah, out? Yeah, I mean, we had very – so I probably would not have used it as, as much as maybe guys do now. I, there's certain things that I like that are like kind of big macro nuggets, you know what I mean? Like, does this guy swing early with runners in scoring position? Like, like I knew that despite my changeup being good – right on left for me that like throwing a lot of changeups to Chase Utley was not going to be a winning strategy for me. Right. Like Chase Utley like was pretty good on changeups type of stuff. So Uh is there something that I should definitely do or is there something that I definitely should not do? Like those were types of things. I mean, I remember one time and I defied the scout, you know, it's like, man, you can't go in on Martin Prado. And I just was like, man, I think I got that up here. I'm going to do it. And I probably almost hit him in the belt buckle. And guess what he did, Wayne? He had a homer off the left field foul pole. Okay. (laughs) So it's just like you talk about being elite at something, right? Like that's an elite trait. And so I was like, well, you know, that was, that was not a, that was not a good one. And, um, but yeah, just, well, it goes goes back to, like you said earlier, we were talking about know who you are and about the ultimate goal of, of what the pitcher is doing is to win the game. So, uh, I think if you know who you are and you know the result that you want, do you right. want to ground ball the shortstop or do you want to strike out? Right. I think all those things come to play. Right. You know? I think too, what you're mentioning too, like having the heat maps of whatever, everything, the most important heat map is happening right now. Where, you know, where was the first pitch I threw them? And, and can I properly judge? Like, again, like sometimes we don't know where down is or we don't know where up is, you know? So did I throw it up and I thought, you know, do I have a carry fastball? And I thought I nailed that pitch and I can go there again, but it actually wasn't up. So, you know, or if I'm facing a guy the second or third time in a, in a game, that heat maps, the one that I'm pulling out of my hat, that, that those pitches aren't on that heat map. You know what I mean? So I've got to kind of know where I've been in certain parts of, of the game already and, and let those things um, kind of work themselves, meld themselves together. So let's suppose you threw a sinker and the guy fouled it off above his bat. So, you know, it's not going low enough. Right. What kind of adjustment were you making to get it down lower? Well, so um, whether it is was it, men- is it mental or is it physical or 
Um, so location, location wise, you know, that's obviously pretty easy to do, you know, in terms of like where you've got to, you know, did I cut myself off or did I not, you know, did I not, do I got to reach like for me to lefty batters, I'd really have to think about reaching more to get it there, you know, to really stay through that pitch. Um, but yeah, or like, did I, did it not go down? Cause I pulled off of the pitch. And so we, you know, we flattened it out type of stuff. So like all those little micro adjustments are happening in the moment, or maybe I just don't have a good one that day. Maybe I thought I threw it. You know, that's the scariest part, right? When you, when you throw the good one and the guy's right on it, you know, like then it's okay. Maybe we need to move. Well, well sometimes you have to just tip your cat that if you got a good, is you got a good hit. Yeah. You know, you yeah. Well, I'll, I'll give you like, get a good hit. My, my real welcome to the big leagues moment was in my third major league start. I had thrown a down and away. It was Chipper Jones's birthday. Okay. I threw a down and away sinker to Chipper Ooh. Jones. Okay. And it, it's funny, the visuals in my head, right? I I barely gotten above double A before I got to the big leagues. And the visuals in my head, when I throw that sinker and it comes off my fingers like that and it's in that location, I'm used to getting this result, right? Chipper put a good swing on it. And I thought like, that's got to be off the end of his bat. You know, that's probably a fly ball to center. That's about as good as somebody's going to do. And sure enough, our center fielder is climbing the wall and it's like 420 out to dead center. And I was like, <laughs> we're dealing with a whole different, we're dealing with a whole different thing here. You know what I mean? And so yeah. those, uh, th then you, then you really got to adjust. But you know what? I think failure mm -hmm. is always an opportunity to learn if you use it right. Yeah. And that, and that if you never had those moments, you would not have improved. So like somebody that goes through and never has a moment like that, they never get to learn and get better. Right. Uh, well, I mean, I, you tell me as, as an engineer, I mean, it's all problem solving, right? And if, yeah. you know, it's, it's, you know, Thomas Edison didn't invent the light bulb on the first try, right? Like, I mean, it took. So Burke, it's been great having you on the show. I mean, I love talking about these kind of details and I could do it all day. Uh, thanks for coming on. Oh, no problem. I enjoy it, Wayne. It's funny, like the people that, you know, really know baseball and love baseball, you get into one, they'll ask me a question and it leads to another question. And yeah, then we're, then, great then, conversations. Yeah, then we're yeah. in the dance, you know, and it, it's stuff, it's fun because it brings up, you know, stuff that I had kind of tucked away and hadn't thought of and everything. And uh, so no, this is this is great. And um, I've enjoyed some of the, the folks that you've had on the podcast and everything and really like that. You're focusing on, uh, you know, command. As we talked, I think the other day, I think command's making a comeback. There's, you can see it in the hitters. There's, there's a lot of guys that are taking pitches that, you know, strikes are that. That's where the incentive is, you know. And they're they're used to being, getting their doors blown off or working vertical middle of the zone and things like that. And now that guys can find some of the edges, um, you know, I think command. Yeah, it's the separator now. Yeah, for sure, no. for sure. And umpires think... are so much better too. So like the command is going to have to be even that much better. Yeah, I think uh, a lot of people would think that when I say I want command, that it's at the expense of velo. Right. And they really should know that I'm saying you need velo, you need command, you need all these things. I'm just saying that there is an important part of pitching that's been neglected and I'm trying to promote that, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, we're going to continue to try to do that with, with the Diamondbacks. And hopefully, um, you know, this weekend we can uh, command ourselves into the strike zone and with, with, with some success. Yeah, that would be awesome to watch. Hey, yeah. th thanks, Burke. Pitching Command Show, brought to you by Command Track, the smart target that MLB and D1 teams rely upon to measure and train command. Many throw hard, but few command. Visit commandtracker.com.